Um, hello, welcome to this next part of the scientific writing course. Um, this lecture is not Julia's, but I'm um, taking over this part about figures. I'm Inge Grünberg, a postdoc in Julia's group. And I'm very happy that she made me do the figures part. Not only because this is the most colorful part of any presentation, but also because I think it's a super important part to highlight your work. No matter if you think about a traditional paper or a presentation you show to someone or a poster, it's always the figures that catch most attention and um, that also deserve a lot of attention when, while making them. So this is the first of uh, four videos on figures. I have the content of the four videos here. So now I talk a little about the basics of figures, uh, show some advice from someone who's more expert than I am and I show you how to first of all try to figure out what to even sh put in a figure, which content and then also the different types of figures that we have. And in the next videos I will show you more details on different figure types and in the last video then finally show you some more detailed tips on, for example, figure design and in the very end also about tables. So let's start with the um, design principles. So here I start with um, an introduction of Edward Tufte. He was not only a scientist in mathematics actually, but also an enthusiast about figures and he wrote several books about good design and um, I have the title pages of two here just for you. You can look him up, of course. And he had um, a very strong opinion about figures and how to make good figures. And I would like to highlight some of his basic advices in the next few slides. Just to start with, he didn't like PowerPoint. So of course, now I'm using PowerPoint to show you um, all this information about figures, but PowerPoint is um, not generally the best idea to present information because you have very little space on one single slide. And if you even use like the inbuilt functions of PowerPoint to create your graphs, they will be all very simplified. And you don't have so many different options to create your graphs. Edward Tufte advises not to use PowerPoint just because of this hierarchical order as you can see in this cartoon. I hope you can read it or you look it up in the slides later on. He just thinks that PowerPoint might not allow enough creativity and enough different formats of um, figures. So just to start with the oldest infographic that is known. This is one from 1896 um, about how Napoleon was um, marching with his army towards Moscow. I'm sure this is now too small for you to see all the details. But still, this is a very impressive graph because basically the line thickness here shows how many people were in Napoleon's army and you see where how they started with a huge army and how it got smaller and smaller and smaller until they reached Moscow. And then the black line is the way back. So basically very few people made it um, until like home again. And this is a very impressive way of showing all these numbers. To uh, summarize this graph, you would need a lot of pages of text and this is much more easy to understand in this way. And also he put some additional information like air temperature on the way back to show that um, it was super cold and that also um, played a role in um, din diminishing his army size. So this figure is the first infographic that doesn't only contain like a really as detailed as possible um, way to show the truth but also some numbers and I will also uh, give you a lot of other examples how to show numbers but also other figures. Edward Tufte just uh, wrote a couple of general rules that should apply to all figures. First of all he stresses the importance of figures in general uh, like there's 
graphics reveal data. So if you put data in a table, for example, it's the best way to hide it. If you have it in a graph, people can intuitively directly see what is meant by this graph and what the data shows. And um, of course, you need to have to something have something to show. For example, this is a uh, um, citation from Tufti is a silly theory means a silly graphic. So of course, first of all, think of what you actually want to show. And then he advises to show very data rich graphs. So really show your original data, include all the data gaps and um, the scatter. Don't just show like a general mean value or a total number. So he really thinks that with showing original data, you can better see the patterns, for example, trends. That's what this point, so avoid aggregations, like don't show only a smooth version of your data, but really more the original data points. Now this is more about the planning of your figures. You, like as, you, as Julia told you, um, a lot of times the whole paper has to follow like a general idea. You need to have like one main message that is explained and developed throughout the paper. And this of course also applies to your graphics. So your figures need to really have a clear message. You need to first think about what do you, I want to show and then um, how can I show it. And this is also what Edward Tafti is advising. So really ask yourself what is happening, um, what is the main content. And then of course the next step is to wonder how to show it. So think about your design, explore your sense of style, look at other people, how they made their figures and see what you like and dislike and then come up with your own style. So this is uh, again a summary of this basic considerations that I already touched on. So um, ask yourself, what do I want the reader to learn? So what is the main content? Then next part is the formatting of the graphic. And then it's also important, and I will stress that again later on, what type of publication is a graphic for? For example, is it a paper or a poster or a oral presentation. And then also it's about other details that we have. So what do I need to add to this figure? And one part here is always also a really detailed caption. So really all information that's needed to understand the figure is there in one place and you don't need to look it up throughout the whole paper. So another part of the basic considerations is um, that the figures in a paper are generally different than the figures that you use for exploratory data analysis. So what you generally do when you get your data is you start plotting them in a lot of different ways. Just scatter plots, all variables versus all other variables, or box plots, and these kind of graphs. Of course, some of those you might be able to use later in a paper, but really the concept is very different because in exploratory data analysis is like for yourself to understand what do my data show, where is an interesting pattern, do I really see what I expected to in my hypothesis. But this is now is about something completely different, which is not about you understanding your data, but you already have your main result and you want it to like to convince the reader that this is really um, shown by your data. So how to make your main result most clear. This might need a very different figure than what you have when you just want to understand the data yourself. So don't just take your figure from the exploratory data analysis and put it into the paper, but first I think about these general things, what I mentioned before, the general content, what do I want to show, and then um, make the figures that you need to convince the reader. As I highlight in multiple parts of my talk, figures are useful in a lot of sections of your manuscript. Sometimes the introduction, not so much, but definitely figures are very useful in the message section and in the results section. Only the discussion section never has figures because everything that you refer to in the discussions has to be already mentioned in the results. So that would be the figure goes into the results part 
and you refer to it in the discussion. But of course not every number goes into a display. So if you really only have three numbers to compare, everybody can do that in their head. Nobody needs a figure to just compare the size of three different numbers, for example, or four if it's a small number. You can just write it in the text, especially as lots of journals have um, limits to how many figures you can show. So this is what I mentioned before, that you have to consider the type of publication you're preparing your figure for. So here I have really very roughly described the difference between scientific papers, presentations, posters and outreach material. There are lots of differences, that's why I would advise you not to just use the same figure, exactly the same figure for everything. Of course, you might want to show the same content, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the figure is exactly the same. So for example, the number of figures is usually limited in a scientific paper, why you can have many more figures in an oral presentation. And posters always have more space for figures. While some, if you do outreach and you have like a general introduction to your topic, Sometimes you might be limited to just one figure. And also the time the reader spends on your figure is very different. So when you have a scientific paper, you can have the reader read it and understand all details, take as much time as he or she wants. But if you have a presentation, it's you yourself who defines how long each slide is shown and how long the reader has to understand it. And if you have outreach material, for example, most people will probably only look at it very shortly. So you need to um, take this into account and adjust the amount of information you want to show in your figures. On the other hand, if you have an oral presentation, you are able to explain additional details. Um, just talk to the people that maybe you see somebody is looking skeptical and you can explain more or you can even ask, is it clear? or um, get feedback from your audience directly, while this is of course not possible if you think about a scientific paper. All these things really influence the level of detail you can put in a figure. So it can be quite high in a scientific paper, it doesn't need to be high, but it definitely needs to be quite low in a presentation because people won't be able to see details really, especially if they look if they sit further away from the screen or if they have poor eyesight. So this is something you need to consider when you do an oral presentation that people might sit further in the back and have a poor eyesight. So re really make sure that the fonts are really big. Also in a scientific paper, please don't make fonts tiny. That's something I will stress multiple times because it's very important to me. You see so many figures where the fonts are really too small. So please make fonts big enough and everything that doesn't fit then in the figure, it's probably too much. So you need to get rid of content if it's too busy with big enough fonts. The use of color is also a bit different. So usually in a scientific paper, you would have less colors than you would use in a presentation or on a poster. And we have um, the possibility to add additional elements like arrows pointing to something, which you would do to a certain extent in a paper, but definitely if you have a big poster where you need more elements to structure the whole space. So this is the introduction about different figure types. First of all, I will explain you what data reproductions are. So this is something that's not processed really. So there's just a picture of the landscape, for example, this is a classical example. And uh, you could also think of an accurate drawing. Then the next part is schematics. So this is already um, simplified and um, things like a flow chart um, where you show the different steps of work that were necessary to obtain your results, for example, or the schematic of the landscape where you highlight all the elements that are important. Then of course we are in geography and I have a separate um, little chapter on maps because everybody sooner or later has to do with maps and geography and there's lots to do right or wrong about maps and I think you deserve a whole own lecture on this topic, but I will of course just be able to touch on it a little bit. 
And the next is data compilation. So this is how you show your numerical data. And this is what you will most likely need to um, highlight your results. So this is all part of the next um, three little videos. So the next video is about these two. And the maps and data compilation is the third video. And then I have a fourth on uh, some more general things and a conclusion. Thank you for watching.